Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Which GeForce GTX 1070 or 1080 should you buy? Comparison video. In this video, we're going to take a look at the performance, features, price, and specifications of seven different GeForce GTX 1070 cards. I'll be comparing them to the 1080 versions of those cards. I'm going to show you benchmarks. I'm going to make specific recommendations over whether I think you should buy one, two, or three fan versions of these cards. What's the best? What's the fastest? What's the slowest? What kind of computers you can install them in? I'm going to talk about price to performance, and then I'm going to include a bonus benchmark of a 6 gigabyte GTX 1060 to compare to the 1070 and 1080 cards. Now before we get into the specific cards, a few things. Each of these cards in both 1070 and 1080 trim will be linked in the video description below to both Amazon and Newegg. If during the course of this video you find a card that I talk about or you see a benchmark on, you go, you know, I think that's the card I want. Go check the prices at both Amazon and Newegg. Sometimes Amazon's cheaper, sometimes Newegg's cheaper. That's why there's two different sets of links down there, so you can compare prices and get the deal that's best for you. Furthermore, I want to talk about the 1070 and 1080 in general before I talk about the specific cards. Who should even be watching this video should you be considering one of these cards? Now the 10 series came out last year from NVIDIA and it starts all the way down now at 1030 and goes all the way through the 1080 Ti. I will have an upcoming video actually comparing the entire line of cards going all the way from the 1030 to the 1080 Ti in one video. If you are not subscribed to my channel, please click that subscribe button down there to get notifications for when that and other game performance videos come out in the future. The GTX 1070 is an excellent mid-range card. It provides great performance at either 1080p or 1440p in the vast majority of games available today and should cover you very well through the end of 2018, even at high or ultra detail, depending upon the resolution that you're running at and, of course, the specific game. But as for today, in the summer of 2017 when I'm filming this, at 1080p resolution, the GTX 1070 will basically play any game on the market today at either high or ultra detail at 60 plus frames per second without much complaint. At 1440p, it will play pretty much every game currently on the market at high detail at about 60 frames per second without complaint. There will be one or two exceptions. There's always the exception that proves the rule. But one or two unoptimized games should not dissuade you from buying what is actually a really, really good card. Now, what about the 1080? The 1080 in general is 25% faster than the 1070. What does that turn into in terms of real world numbers? Well, let's say for the sake of discussion that your 1070 was averaging 50 frames per second. That means that a 1080 would be getting 62 and a half frames per second. That's 25% more. Is it worth the extra 100 to $120 that a 1080 costs over a 1070? Actually, I think it is. If you have the money where prices are currently at in the summer of 2017, the 1080 makes a lot of sense. It's, of course, more money up front, and I realize that not everybody has that. The, the other way you can go is the 1060. You can go down to a 1060. The 1060 is a great card in its own right. The primary issue with the 1060 in the moment is pricing. The availability is very thin in the summer of 2017 due to the Ethereum and Bitcoin miners. Now, I'm not going to get into what cryptocurrency and mining is in this video, and it certainly will date itself very quickly, because three months from now, if you're watching this video, you might be going, what are you talking about? 1060s are available everywhere for cheap, and they might be. But I'm filming this in June of 2017, and right now, the least expensive GTX 1060 you can find online, 6 gigabyte card, is $300. A few weeks ago, they were a lot less than that. At $300 for a 1060, versus $400 for a 1070, I would take the 1070 all day long. The 1070 is a noticeable jump in performance over a 1060, much better at 1440p, reasonably better at 1080p. It's definitely worth the extra $100 to go from three to $400. You are spending 25% more, but in general, you're getting 50% more performance. Well, 50% more performance at 1440p, a little less than that at 1080p. Now, of course, then the argument becomes, why don't you spend another $100 to get a 1080? If you have the money, do so. The more graphics card you buy, the further in the future you push the need to upgrade. And this is true whether you buy an AMD card, NVIDIA card, whether you're looking at mid-range, high-end, or low-end cards. The more you spend, 
the more future-proofing you buy, the further into the future you get performance before you need to upgrade. A 1080 Ti will get you a whole nother year of performance over the 1080, for example. It's a good 35% faster than a 1080. They're also $700, and very few people want to spend $700 on a graphics card. We'll look at that in more detail in a future video. Let me bring the focus back to games and the 1070 and 1080, which is what we're looking at today. Now, there's two primary types of games I want to talk about. There's AAA games, and then there's eSports titles. AAA games are games such as Battlefield 1, Grand Theft Auto 5, Ghost Recon Wildlands, The Division, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, those sorts of games. Big budget, big fancy, beautiful graphics that require lots of computer power to play. These cards will work wonderfully at either 1080p or 1440p. At 1440p, you'll have to turn the detail down a notch or two. Now, I'm going to show you a Ghost Recon Wildland benchmarks on all of these cards here at the end of this video. But in short, at 1080p, the 1070 is a great card that basically plays everything available on the market without complaint. Um, either at high or ultra detail, generally ultra in most games, high in one or two, but it's a great, great card. At 1440p, it's a great high detail card. Now understand that I'm talking about 60 frames per second, which is what most people play at. Now, if you have a high refresh rate monitor and you want to play at higher speeds, that is a separate conversation. I'll come back to high refresh rate gaming in just a minute. Now, the GTX 1080 basically extends that. It simply gives you higher performance levels for longer periods of time. While the 1070 is a great card today, it will have to be replaced sooner than the 1080 will. So you're essentially buying anywhere from six months to a year of being able to play games at higher ultra detail before it's time to replace your card. If you spend $400 for a 1070 versus say $500 for a 1080, that extra 20% may very well buy you 30 to 40% more time with the card before the detail has to drop. I actually think in the summer of 2017, the 1080 is now the deal if you've got the $500 to buy one. Now that's 1080p and 1440p for AAA gaming. Let me talk about 1440p ultra wide as well as 4K and multi-monitor for AAA gaming. The GTX 1070 and the GTX 1080 simply don't have the horsepower necessary to be effective ultra wide 1440p or 4K or multi-monitor gaming cards at this point in 2017. Yes, they will do it. Yes, you can find some detail setting to make it work in most games at those resolutions. Now, quick note, what is 1440p ultrawide? Those are the big 21 by 9 ultrawide screens, 3440 by 1440. They are actually much more demanding than standard 1440p. And I should have mentioned this earlier, but in short, standard 1440p is 2560 by 1440. It's 3.6 million pixels. Ultra wide 1440 or 3440 by 1440 is 5 million. It's actually much closer to 4K. It's not quite there because 4K is 8 million, but it is a 1.4 million pixel jump just to have that ultra wide 1440p versus standard. It is demanding enough to really, in my opinion, make the 1070 a non starter. The 1080 will do it, but you're going to run out of horsepower really quick, even in the games coming out in the fall of 2017, to say nothing of 2018. Now, 4K. 4K is 8.3 million pixels. It is four times as much resolution as 1080p. Can you play Grand Theft Auto V at 4K resolution on one of these cards? Yes, it will. You have to lower the detail settings down, and it will do it, but it won't necessarily be the best experience. Ghost Recon Wildlands? Forget it. Yeah, it'll run, put it at medium detail in a 1080, and it's acceptable, but it's not great. What about the other games on the market? Assassin's Creed Syndicate Battlefield 1? Yeah, Battlefield 1 will run at medium detail at 4K on a 1080. But keep in mind, the Battlefield 1 came out last year, not this year. You're really, really stretching it. Multi-monitor gaming? Three monitors in ultra-wide NVIDIA surround configuration, even 1080p monitors, that is 6 million pixels. That's even more demanding than 1440p ultrawide. So what should you buy if you're going to buy a nice big 34 inch 1440p ultrawide display with 5 million pixels or three 1080p monitors in NVIDIA surround or a 4K monitor? 
If you want to play AAA games, if you want to play Ghost Recon Wildland, Mass Effect Andromeda, if you want to play the upcoming games in the fall of 2017, there's only one card to buy, and that is the GTX 1080 Ti. And yes, it's expensive at $700, but it's really what you need to play those types of games at those resolutions. Now, having just brought that up, let me quickly transition to esports titles. Do you want to play Overwatch at 4K resolution at 100 frames per second? No, you don't need a 1080 Ti to do that. Frankly, a 1070 or a 1080 would be a great choice for that. Do you want to play World of Tanks or World of Warships or League of Legends or Dota 2 at 4K resolution? No, you don't need a 1080 Ti for any of those. A 1070 would be an excellent choice. I have in fact live streamed most of those games at 4K resolution on this exact GTX 1070 right here. If you've been watching my channel and you've watched my previous live streams, I've live streamed World of Tanks, World of Warships, League of Legends, Overwatch. I've live streamed Star Wars The Old Republic. On this exact 1070 you're seeing right here, the Asus Republic of Gamers Strix, on my older i7 4790K, 60 frames per second, while recording the game locally in addition to that without any problems, no frame rate drops, no complaints. Ghost Recon Wildland in 4K? Yeah, complete disaster. Even 1440p would not stream on this card, not even at medium detail. It simply didn't have the power. So there is a huge gulf of performance requirements between AAA games and casual and esports games, which is why uh, a few minutes ago I made the point to separate the two out. If you want to play at high resolutions, at high detail settings in AAA games, 1080 Ti, there is no other choice, except maybe Vega. AMD does have Vega coming out in August, about two months from when I'm filming this video. We have no details of performance, price, specifications, so I'm not going to discuss it because we are too far from the launch. I promise you I will review Vega when it comes out, assuming the cryptocurrency miners don't buy every card on the market. We'll see what it looks like in August when that comes out. But if you want to play Overwatch, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Dota 2, League of Legends, World of Tanks, World of Warships, War Thunder, games like that at 1440p or even 4K, these cards will do that very, very well. What about playing those games at 1080p or standard 1440p? These cards are almost overkill, to be completely honest with you. Do you want to play Overwatch at 1080p at 100 frames per second? A 1050 Ti will do that for $130. These cards are complete overkill for that. Do you want to play World of Tanks, World of Warships, Dota 2 at 1080p at high detail? These cards are way overkill. A 1080 Ti for $130 will do that without any issue. So for esports games, yes, you can buy these cards but you're spending a lot of money unnecessarily, which is why I can live stream those games at 4K on a 1070, because it's overkill for those games. But it won't live stream Ghost Recon Wildlands or Assassin's Creed Syndicate or um, The Division, because it doesn't have the horsepower at high resolutions. The requirements for those games are just a mile and a half apart from the AAA titles. So if you're watching this video and you wanna play those games at 4K, you came to the right place. If you want to play the AAA games at 4K, 1080 Ti. Well, I think that's enough overview. Why don't we get into the specifics of each of these cards? Now, remember, all of these are linked in the video description below for both the 1070 and 1080 versions. I am not going to mention any specific pricing here. It would never last. It changes too often. But I do encourage you to check current pricing down there. As a general rule, so long as you're happy with the card in terms of appearance and brand, buy whichever one's cheapest. There is no substantial performance difference, spoiler alert, between any of these cards. Now I will show you the performance at the end of this video, but the reality is it's at the end of the video and not the beginning for a reason. The difference between the slowest and fastest card here is small enough that only benchmarks are going to detect it. You would never notice the difference in actual day-to-day -day use. In no particular order, we're going to start with the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix 3-Fan GTX 1070. Now this is a large, heavy card. I quite like this card. I like its appearance. I like its heft. This is a very, very heavy card. Now, you definitely want a good motherboard to put this in. Don't be installing this in a cheap board, but you shouldn't be. It, it's a big card. It's going to take a large case. You'll need a mid-tower or larger case in general to fit it. It's long this way. It's also tall. 
This is the bracket here that is a standard PCI Express slot. You can see it extends about an inch taller than that, so you need a lot of clearance in your case for it. There are three very large fans here, which means that it runs cool and quiet. Low temperatures, extremely low noise. In fact, when playing some games, if you were to buy this card and play, for example, World of Tanks at 1080p resolution, the fans may not even turn. I can tell you League of Legends at 1080p, these fans don't even turn. So that's a nice feature if you want a silent system. A large cooler such as this allows that. We have a very nice back plate back here. This is not a cooling enhancement. This is strictly a cosmetic and rigidity feature. It does, however, provide you something nice to set the card down on, and it looks nice because when the card is installed in your system, this is actually what you see. Speaking of which, we have full RGB lighting on this card. Uh, the ASUS ROG Strix card is supported by the ASUS Aurora software. So if you have an ASUS ROG Strix motherboard, you can use their software to synchronize the RGB lighting between this card, this little bit up here, and some on the back with your motherboard if you like that sort of thing. Now, in terms of its height, this has a very nice feature. We have a single 8-pin PCI Express power connector, which is good because you don't need more than one on these 1070s, but it's recessed. Notice it does not come up as high as the top of the card. So when you insert your power connector, you can bend the cable over a bit and the card, nothing will extend beyond the height of the card itself. You can wrap it down here or over the side. Whichever way you want to go, it does mean that you don't go this way in terms of its Z height too much. I like that feature. Now, this is a unique feature to this card. As far as I know, the ASUS ROG Strix are the only ones that have it. We have a couple of PWM four pin case fan connectors here. Wait, what, on a graphics card? Yes. This allows you to plug your case fans into your graphics card rather than your motherboard. When do you really need a lot of air circulation in your case? When you're gaming. When you're not gaming and just in Windows, the graphics card largely shuts down and produces very little heat. It uses maybe 20 or 30 watts. It's not a heat issue when you're not gaming. Likewise, your CPU in your system does not make a lot of heat when you're just in Windows, unless maybe you're doing video editing or video rendering, that kind of thing. But when you're just in Windows, uh, when you're just web browsing or watching videos such as this, there's no heat being produced. The fans in your case can cycle down and make your system very cool. If you plug your case fans into these two ports right here, when the graphics card starts making heat, it will spin up your case fans to start exhausting the heat out of your case because it gets quite hot when it runs. So that's a nice feature unique to this card. Now, most of these cards have the same ports on the back, so I won't cover them on every card, but we basically have a DVI-D port here, digital video display, uh, digital video interface, digital port here. This supports up to 1600p using a dual link cable. We also have DisplayPort 1.4 and HDMI 2.0. These ports, uh, these ports uh, support up to 4K at 60 hertz on the DisplayPort 2.0 and 4K at 120 hertz on the DisplayPort 1.4s. Now we don't really have any dis, uh, 4K 120 hertz panels yet, but those are coming very soon. Some were recently displayed. Um, earlier this year at some of the trade shows. And so by the end of this year, we should see some. Of course, you're not gonna be gaming at 4K at 120 frames per second, but it's nice to have the feature there in, well, mostly just to get the displays ready for future proofing. Overall, a very nice card. Now, as I said before, performance-wise, this card is not faster than any of these others. If you're thinking, well, this single fan gigabyte, it must be slower than this card. No, not really. It will be, um, not quite as cool and not quite as quiet as this card, and that is a difference between them, is temperature and noise profiles. This is gonna to have to spin its single fan up sooner and do a higher speed than these three fans are going to have to spin. That being said, the noise difference between these cards is pretty minor overall. There's not a huge difference. There's a little bit of a temperature difference, but the benchmarks I'll show you later in the video will show the temperatures of each of these cards running. The next card we're going to talk about is the Gigabyte G1 Gaming. This is also a triple fan card like the ROG Strix is, but it's not as tall. You can see here the bracket connector, and it pretty much ends just slightly above that. This means this will fit into smaller cases or perhaps thinner cases than the ROG Strix will. It also weighs less, so it will put less stress onto your system components. 
we have a single 8-pin PCI Express power connector like the ROG Strix, and this is an RGB card, sort of. There's a little bit of RGB lighting on the top. There is none on the back, none on the front, so while technically they can say, hey, we have lights on the card, it's pretty minor, and yes, you can turn those off if you want. Now, it does have a back plate. What's it for? Rigidity of the card and appearance. It doesn't really do anything else, but I think it looks nice and it's nice to have. As far as the fans go, please note this orange on the front of the card is permanent. Th these are not lights up here, so you can't change those. So if you don't mind the orange, great. If it bothers you, buy one of the other cards. Please note, however, that the card sits like this in your case with the fans facing down. You will probably never ever see the fan side of the card. What will you see? The Gigabyte logo, which does not light up, it just sits there, it's, it's just printed right on there. So basically the card's gonna sit in there and there's a little bit of lights right here. The Gigabyte um, logo here will light up and then there's a fan stop light here to let you know when the fans have stopped. All of these cards will shut their fans off when the game when the cards are not being used for gaming so they're absolutely completely silent when you're just in windows it's only in gaming that they turn the fans on we have the same three basic connectors on the back we have our dvid port and then of course our hdmi 2.0 and display port 1.4 overall it's a very nice card that will fit into most mid-range or high-end computer systems if you are a fan of gigabyte if you can find this at a good price, I recommend it. It runs well, it performs well, its size is nice, it's just big enough to be interesting without being too big and oversized. I think it looks nice. The next card we're gonna talk about is the EVGA Superclocked. Now I'll come back to the two in the middle for a minute, we're gonna save those for last. This card is in most respects almost identical to the Gigabyte G1 Gaming except for the fan count. There's three there, two here, that makes no difference whatsoever. These fans might turn slightly slower than these, but there's three of them, and so in terms of noise and temperatures, it's going to be the same. This is the same height as the Gigabyte G1 Gaming. You can see the bracket right here. The card does not extend very far, a handful of millimeters above the actual bracket, so it will fit anywhere that the G1 Gaming will. There's actually quite a few cards of this size on the market, about this length and about this height. Now, as far as lighting goes, the Superclocked does not have RGB lighting. It has white lighting. You can turn it off, but this logo here will light up white in your system. So it can either be white or it can be off. There's no colors that you can pick from. There is no lighting on the back of the card here. This is just printed on for the logo, but it does have a very nice back plate. And this back plate, again, is not for cooling. It's simply for rigidity and appearance. And of course, when the card is installed in your system, you will see the lights here. And then of course you will see the EVGA logo and the printing on the card. Now as for the fans themselves and the front of the card, you will notice that we sort of have a silver, gray, black motif going on here. Now I have read many people's comments regarding the front. I mentioned the orange on here. That's a personal preference as to whether you like it. But do keep in mind that this is how the card is going to be in your machine. You're never really going to look at it unless you've really got perhaps a tempered glass case with glass all around in which case you probably want to go with one of the RGB cards. But do keep in mind, you aren't going to be looking at this very much. So you like it or you don't, but it's a very, very nice card. It has a single 8-pin PCI Express power connector, just like the other two cards. And we have the standard ports DVI-D. Uh, it's a digital-only port. Do keep in mind, you cannot plug a VGA monitor in here using one of the cheap adapters. You can use a VGA monitor using an active adapter, and that's true of all the cards but I hope you're not using a VGA monitor with a 400R graphics card. In any case, very nice, very good performer. The next card we're gonna talk about is the EVGA for the win. This is a big, heavy card, very similar to the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix card. It is taller, you can see here the bracket comes out here, so it's almost as tall above the bracket as the ROG Strix card is. It is heavy. Very, very similar in weight to the ROG Strix and much heavier than the other cards. Very thick, very heavy heatsink. Now it does have only two fans, but let me tell you from personal experience, because I've had this in one of my machines for a long time. It's not just a testing card. I pulled this out in order to do this video. It's very silent. These fans turn so slowly, this card makes no noise. Both of these cards, the ROG Strix and the For the Win, are unbelievably quiet cards. If silence and low temperatures are your key interests, these are the cards to buy, either one of them. Now this card is different in several respects. 
two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors. Does it need them? No. Why are they there? To be blunt, because I think a lot of people see two and go, well, it must be faster because it has two 8-pin connectors. I assure you, this card does not run any faster than this does. It doesn't overclock any higher. Yes, I've tried. Yes, I've tried with both of them. We'll get to the other one in a minute. It, it really doesn't. It absolutely does not need both of them. However, you have to plug a cable into both of them or the card won't work. So that is one downside if you don't have an extra 8-pin PCI Express power connector. Now, this card is full RGB. Unlike the superclocked, this up here, you can control the color of this. All 16.7 million colors of the rainbow, you can use their software to change this to a strobing effect, to a breathing effect. And it is quite beautiful. It is by far the brightest and most visible of all the RGB cards up here. Even far, far more than the ROG Strix card, which of course with their Aurora software syncs with motherboards, but this is much more colorful. This is the brightest card here. This is extremely bright if you want to turn this to a brighter color. On the front of the card, all of this here lights up. All of these are actually a mesh and there's LEDs behind them all. So this card will actually light up like a Christmas tree. If the biggest, brightest card with the most RGB lights is what you're interested in, you found the right card. Now, as far as height goes, I do wish to caution you. These PCI Express power connectors are right at the top, which means when you plug the cable in, there's going to be a certain distance above the card that the cable is going to rise before you can turn it over. Now, EVGA does sell their power link, which is an L-shaped adapter that will plug into these two ports here. And basically, it's a piece of plastic that comes straight across and straight down and gives you the plugs over here. They charge $10 or $15 for it. If you're interested in one, you can pick one up off of either Amazon, Newegg, or you can order them directly from EVGA. But basically, it's a piece of plastic which plugs into these two ports, and it makes that L-shaped curve a little bit easier, as well as maybe cleaning up the cables in your system. Um, unlike the ROG Strix, which has it recessed, this is, in fact, on the top. Now, no discussion of this card would be complete without talking about the For the Win 2 version. Just to be clear, this is the For the Win, uh, the For the Win 1 version. This is the original release. And this is what the back plate of the For the Win 1 looks like. And it is a different design than the For the Win 2. There's no speed difference between these cards. It's sensors, temperature, and cooler design. In theory, the For the Win 2 runs cooler than the For the Win 1 does. Does it? Well, a little bit, sure. Not much. If you have a For the Win, keep it and enjoy it. There's no reason to replace it. If I could buy a For the Win 1 for $30 or $40 less than a For the Win 2, I would. I have no issues with my For the Win cards. However, if the price is the same, well, by all means, buy the For the Win 2. There's really no reason not to. Now, I'm going to set this down here. I'm going to pick this up, we'll talk about it briefly, and then I'm going to show you both of them side by side. The For the Win 2 is a ever so slightly different color. I don't know if it's going to show up on the camera. It's going to depend upon what device you're watching. But this silver here is a very, very slightly different silver than the silver on the For the Win 1. Minor difference. You're unlikely to notice it once it's physically in your machine. This has full RGB lighting like the For the Win 1 does both up here as well as these panels on the front. And let me be clear, there are additional LED lights here as part of the nine sensor suite. I'm not gonna go into a full review of this here, but essentially if you love sensors and if you love knowing lots of technical details about your card, you love to play with it until the cows come home, you actually probably will enjoy a For the Win too. It does have some upgraded features over the For the Win mostly for technical people who love to get into such things. So there are a few additional LED indicators up there. Ports are the same, height is the same, size is the same. Two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors. The back is very different. The back is actually in two pieces. This is not a single plate, and it's not smooth like the For the Win 1 is. There are grills here for ventilation, grills here as well, and it's got sort of a ribbed, rigid field in the back. This is what you're gonna actually be seeing. When the card sits in your machine, it sits like this, and that's actually what you're gonna see. Let me pick this one up, and there we go. I'll turn them over, and you can see, if I can position them on the camera, what the back of each of these cards look like. For the Win 2, for the Win 1. Does it matter? In my experience, no. But it's a personal preference. And like I said, if the price is the same, by all means, get the For the Win 2. 
But if there's a 30, 40 ish dollar price difference, personally, I'd buy a For the Win one. Otherwise, they are very, very similar cards. And you'll see that in the performance, temperature, and fan speed numbers here in a minute in the video. And finally, we come to the two smaller cards. This is the Zotac GTX 1070 Mini. Also available in a 1080 Mini version, which I will link down below. If you're looking for a small, short card that will fit into a wider variety of systems, this should be on your short list. I've had this installed in one of my older i7 machines for a while. It runs very, very nicely. As you can see here, it is shorter than all the other cards, but it is slightly taller than the Superclocked and the G1 Gaming. It does extend vertically a bit more, but it is substantially shorter than the others. Now this uses a single 8-pin PCI Express power connector, which is just fine, and it has the standard ports on the back just like the other cards do. One difference, no back plate. It is more of a bare bones card. There is simply no back plate here. It's only an appearance issue. When the card's installed in the computer, you'll see it like this, and of course, like the back, you know, without the back plate, you'll just see the metal exposed. So if you care about that, well, that might be a consideration. Noise, no big deal. It's a very quiet card. Temperatures, all maybe slightly higher than the other cards, but really the GTX 1070 in general does not get very hot. Unfortunately, I don't have the 1080 version of the Mini to see how well its temperatures do, but based upon what I've seen on these cards and the 1080 that I have, I don't think it's going to be a big problem, so long as you don't install it in a super small case. That is something to consider. If you try to put this in a very small case with no airflow, temperatures might be an issue, but so long as you have a reasonable amount of airflow within your case, it will be just fine. Overall, a very nice card. I have no complaints. Nothing really fancy or special to say about it other than it's shorter, smaller, weighs less, but runs just fine, as you'll see in the tests in just a minute. Finally, that brings us to the Gigabyte Mini. Yes, this is a single fan GTX 1070, and yes, it does run just fine. Its default out-of-the-box speed is slightly slower than the other cards, but not by so much that you'll notice, as I'll show you later in this video. It also is overclockable, but perhaps not quite as much as the other cards. The reason this exists is not to be the fastest 1070 in the world, but to be the smallest 1070 in the world. It's short. It is tall, however. You can see here that it extends a full inch above the standard PCI Express bracket. So you are having to sacrifice some height in order to get a 1070 into a card this short. That being said, the 8-pin PCI Express power connector is recessed a bit. You can see here, it's about half an inch below the top of the card, making it easier to install the power cable. There is no back plate on this card. It is a no frills, inexpensive card designed for installing into smaller systems. Now this is actually considered to be an ITX card. In theory, this will fit just fine in a mini ITX case. Would I put a GTX 1070 into an ITX case? No, there's not really enough airflow and cooling in such a case. There are exceptions, of course, but one issue you'll run into is if you put this into a small case, thermals might become an issue. When you watch the benchmarks towards the end of this video and you look at the temperatures and fan speed, keep in mind that this card was installed in the same full tower case as all the others. All those tests were done in an actual real case, not an open test bed, but it's a full tower case. So this card had all the airflow in the world in order to be good. I actually don't own any mini ITX cases to do a test in. I could do a test in that. And that back there is what this is designed for. That is the $450 Acer Aspire T pre-built desktop computer that I have reviewed many times on my channel, game tests, upgrade videos. It's a nice machine for $450. I can tell you with absolute certainty, this card fits in that machine perfectly. In fact, while I didn't pull this out of that machine to do this video, I did pull this out of another one of my Acer pre-builds. I have an Acer Aspire i5-4460 4th Gen Haswell Refresh Machine, very similar in size to that computer that this was actually installed in. Now please note that if you want to buy this graphics card and install it in that $450 computer, you will have to replace the power supply. 
While that power supply will work for a 1050 Ti or even a GTX 1060 just fine, it's not going to drive this because of the 8-pin PCI Express power. You really need a, an upgraded power supply. And if you're spending $400 on a graphics card, a $30 power supply should not be an issue. By the way, my fourth gen machine with this graphics card, $30 power supply. It's the EVGA 400 watt power supply that I've previously reviewed on my channel. It doesn't take any more than that. It plays games just fine. So if you already own a basic pre-built, and it doesn't have to be the Acer, it could be the Asus M32 CD, which I've also covered on my channel. It could be a Lenovo, it could be an HP or a Dell. If it's a, a mini tower case of that size in a pre-built and you're able to replace the power supply with a 400 watt or greater, a 30 to $40 power supply would be plenty, then you could buy this card and get great gaming performance. Now, please note that if you don't already own one of those, I don't actually recommend that you go buy that and buy this. This really and all of these should be installed in higher end machines. But if you already have it and you simply want to get great gaming performance, it at least provides you an option because these bigger cards will not physically fit in those machines. Finally, I want to talk about the 1080 versions of all of these cards. Can you tell the difference between these two? One is a 1070, one is a 1080. They're both EVGA for the wins. They both have full RGB lighting. They both have the exact same connectors on the end. They both have, they're quite heavy. They both have the same back plates on the back. They're exactly the same in basically all respects, except one has a 1070 in it and the other has a 1080. The PCI Express power connectors, the length, the size, the back plate, the connectors are all identical. I'm gonna set these down because they're kind of heavy. As a general rule, all of these cards in the 1070 and 1080 versions are identical. There are a few exceptions. The Zotac 1070 Mini is a little bit different in appearance than the 1080 Mini. The fan shroud and the style are slightly different and the dimensions are ever so slightly different, but not by much. But the Superclocked 1080 and the Superclocked 1070, the Asus Republic of Gamers 1080 and 1070 are basically exactly the same. So if you see one of these cards and go, I'm okay to spend an extra $100 to get another 20, 25% performance, I'd like to future-proof myself a little bit, keep in mind that in general, they're exactly the same. With perhaps the sole exception of the Gigabyte Mini, which I actually don't think exists in a 1080 version, but all the others are exactly the same. The final card I briefly want to show you and mention to you is the EVGA GeForce GTX 1060 6GB for the win. This card is the step below all of these 1070s. Now, if this is available for $150 or less below the price of the 1070, then it's a deal and I recommend it all day long. Unfortunately, in June 2017 when I'm filming it, it's not. The price of these has gone up and so it's no longer the deal that it was even last month. In the future, if you're watching this video at some point in the future and you can find these for under $250, then it might be a deal again. But I just want to mention it because I'm going to show you the results of this later in the video so you can see what I was testing compared to the other cards on the desk. Well, I think that's plenty of talking at this point. Let's get to some benchmark results. But before I show them to you, I want to be clear. I'm going to split screen these and put three cards on the screen and just show you the MSI afterburner numbers. Now, this does mean that a large chunk of the recorded video is lost because the bottom two thirds of each screen is going to be cut off. The purpose is to keep the video from being ridiculously long. So do keep in mind, I will put labels on this side of the screen across from the MSI Afterburner numbers to let you know which card is which, and we'll talk about it as the numbers come up. First up, we have the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix, the Gigabyte G1 Gaming, and the EVGA Superclocked card. You can see I've split the screens here and done my best to try to synchronize the runs so you can see them in real time. But the primary thing to look at here is the MSI afterburner numbers, not the actual image on the screen. Yes, I will have benchmark charts at the end, and this will run pretty quick since I'm doing three cards at a time. You'll notice that the graphics cards are 100% utilized looking at that first 98% number. Then you can see the temperatures of the cards, the percentage fan speed, the registered RPM of the fan speed, at least it's reported by the card, and then the clock speed of the card, of the actual chip. Please note these are not overclocked. These are the out-of-the-box configuration. This is NVIDIA's GPU Boost 
automatically running the cards as fast as they can. At least that's what these cards run at out of the box. Now we're on to the next three cards, the For the Win 2, the Gigabyte Mini, and the Zotac Mini. Now please note that all of these cards will overclock further. In MSI Afterburner, typing a plus 100 on the GPU clock and a plus 250 on the VRAM works just fine. That puts many of these cards at or above 2 gigahertz and it puts the VRAM speed at about 4.25 gigahertz which of course DDR you double that that puts it at about eight and a half effective gigahertz clock speed. Now I'm not going to try to read every number on the screen these benchmarks run too fast but you can fast forward and rewind and pause this video and take a look at the temperatures the fan speeds and the clock speeds to your heart's content. So the first two runs here, the previous run and this one, were all 1070s. This next run here is 1060, 1070, and 1080, all for the win one cards. You can see the frame rate here is dramatically different. The frame rate was largely the same between the first six cards that I showed you. Here we have the last 1070 card, which is the For the Win 1, and then on top of it we have the 1060, and below it we have the 1080. If you like this format, if you want to see more of it, be sure to comment down in the, in the comment section below and let me know what you think of this type of testing. To the best of my knowledge, this may actually be the first time I've ever done a split screen like this, and certainly uh, in an organized fashion with a built-in benchmark. I don't recall if I've done it before, but you can see the frame rates here. I'm going to show you a chart in just a minute, but before I do that, I'm going to show you a small piece of real-time gameplay. It's not going to be very long on the ASUS Republic of Gamer Strix card simply to show you the difference between a built-in benchmark and real-time gameplay. Now, as you can see from the title card in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, this is the ASUS Republic of Gamer Strix. It's not going to make any difference which 1070 I stick in here for this. You're looking at a very, very small overall performance difference. But I want to put just a minute or so of this in here. Okay, maybe three minutes, but it won't be like a 20-minute run like I do in my other videos. This way you can see the full frame, full frame rate of the game. You can see real-time frames as we're driving around. You can see the clock speed, the fan speed. A couple of comments I want to make about my testing methodology while this is running. First of all, all these cards were installed in an actual full tower computer case. It's a Corsair Obsidian 750D. It's a very nice full tower case, but they were in fact installed in a real computer. A lot of benchmark testing gets done on what's called open air benchmark uh, test beds to where the card is literally sitting in the middle of the room with nothing affecting it whatsoever. Now that's fine for what it is, I suppose, but if the whole idea is to look at temperatures, clock speeds, fan speeds, it needs to be in a real computer. Now I will be the first to acknowledge that a Corsair Obsidian 750D full tower case is not your typical machine. I understand these cards will be installed in smaller computers. The whole key to getting good clock speeds and low temperatures is to have airflow two intake and two exhaust fans, or maybe one intake, one exhaust, but make sure it's balanced, have a similar number of intake or exhaust, make sure that your vents are clear, make sure that you have airflow around the machine. If you have a liquid cooler on your CPU or a radiator, include that in your balancing of the system. And if you have dust filters on the front or back of your computer, make sure you blow them out from time to time with some compressed air um, to make sure that your system is still getting good airflow. Now, everything you've watched in this video is at stock clock speeds. You can see here we're at 1974 megahertz on the ASUS ROG Strix. That card and the For the Win cards run the fastest out of the box. Of course, the real difference between these and the others is pretty minor, as I'll show you in some charts here in a second. However, they all take a plus 100. So this will run at about 2,075 megahertz rather than 1,975 megahertz if you put a plus 100 into MSI Afterburner. Same thing with the RAM as I mentioned before. My general advice, if you have a GTX 1070 and you want to play Ghost Recon Wildlands at 1080p, set the detail to very high. While we're getting close to 60 frames per second, there's, well, there was some stutter. We're on the i7-7700K. The frame rates are higher on this as a side note than they are on Ryzen 7 but it does stutter down into the 30 frames per second from time to time. You've seen two already if you were watching closely, one just a second ago and then one earlier in the run. I might have skipped over one. I've, I've cut it out. I'm showing you a convoy chase here before we cut to the benchmark results. 
Um, the i7-7700K is definitely a solid 5 to 10 frames per second faster than Ryzen 7 is, but it stutters more. I see dips, there's like these half second stutters down into the mid 30s every couple of minutes of gameplay, whereas the Ryzen 7 doesn't tend to have that. I really need to do an updated Ryzen 7 versus i7 comparison. I'll probably do it with Skylake X, which is coming very, very soon, and I'll have a full review and a build on Skylake X as well, because that kind of gives you the best of both worlds if you don't mind paying for it. And here we are at the first benchmark result chart. I'll show you the 1060, 1070, and 1080 in just a second. Basically, the green bars are the average, the red bars are the minimum, and the blue bars are the max. As you can see, they're all within a couple of frames per second of each other. The For the Win and the Republic of Gamer Strix cards are the fastest by one or two frames per second. Quick note on testing methodology. Every time you run this built-in benchmark, the, the results can actually vary by one frame per second, give or take. I ran each test five times. I completely ignored the first two runs because that just gets the cards warmed up and gets everything loaded into RAM. I then ran it three more times and I took the middle result of those three runs. If you overclock all of these cards by 100 megahertz on the GPU and 250 megahertz on the VRAM, you add an average of two frames per second to each card. The actual differences in results don't really change. So if you want that extra one or two frames per second and you want to buy a For the Win or ROG Strix, okay, yeah, they are slightly faster. But you don't buy those cards for their performance. You buy them for their larger fans, their larger heat sinks, their appearance, the RGB lighting, and so on. The next chart that I'm gonna show you is the 1060 versus 1070 versus 1080. The green bars are the averages, and as you can see here, the only card which averaged over 60 frames per second was the GTX 1080, and by just barely four frames per second. The 1070 did 54, and the 1060 did 41. Now, these are built-in benchmarks. Let me tell you from personal experience, you'll get a little bit less than this when you're actually playing the game, and when you're in heavy combat situations, you can easily get 10 frames per second less than these averages when there's explosions and fighting going on when you most need the performance. Now, this is an ultra detail. It's fairly easy to fix. Lower it to high detail, and Ghost Recon Wildlands is very, very playable on a GTX 1060 at 1080p. If you want to lift those 1070 numbers to over 60 frames per second, lower it to very high detail. This simply shows the progression of performance between the three cards, and while the 1060 is a great, great 1080p gaming card, keep in mind that we already have games which are struggling to play at 1080p and that's only going to get worse going into next year. That's one of the reasons I made this video was to point out how much performance difference there really is. We're looking at a nearly 15 frame per second difference between a 1060 and a 1070 and when you lower the detail down to very high or high the difference is even greater than that. So there you have all the results. This has been the GeForce GTX 1070 and 1080 7 card review. Which one should you buy? Like this video if you like it. Share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge red button directly below. Questions and comments in the comment section. And please use the links in the video description to Amazon and Newegg when doing your shopping. If you found this video helpful and useful, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.